me great pleasure to re introduce Rebecca Bennyworth, a true legend within the tax world. Rebecca is well known, a much admired tax speaker, writer, and has been lecturing extensively for a number of years. I've spared the blushes. She is deputy, she's not deputy chair of the tax faculty. She is now chair of the tax faculty of ICAW as of last Monday. And if I was into tweeting, I would have known that already, I was told by Henry. Um, apart from that, she's also editor of Tolly's TaxWise, consultant editor of Tolly's Income Tax, and consultant editor of Accounting Web, and until recently, editor of the Tax Advisor magazine. And if that wasn't enough, She's also a member of the Admin Burdens Advisory Board, a body which advises and supports HMRC in reducing the burden on the tax system, which you can imagine a full-time job on its own. Uh, anyway, we're very lucky to have her here, her here today to start the weekend with the first keynote speech, Tax Support for Innovation and Growth. So over to you, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. It's lovely to be here. Um, I last spoke uh, at one of your events in uh, in the Midlands, I think. So uh, I've come up to the to the uh, industrial north. Well, for me, from the very far southwest, I guess that's what it is. Um, it's uh, a fantastic topic and a great time to be talking about this topic. Obviously, themed to the conference because you're looking at growth through innovation, uh, and we're coming out. We hope and the. Uh, Chairman of the Bank, Governor of the Bank of England assures us we are now coming out of a very, very long period of poor financial uh, performance, both for the economy as a whole and, of course, for our businesses, our clients' businesses have struggled. Some haven't survived, uh, but those that have are looking perhaps forward to the future with um, an eye on where we're going next. Um, so... Here are the main tax measures that I've got about an hour to talk about. Now, I could easily do three hours uh, on these, but um, those of you who know me know I could do three hours on absolutely anything. I might find seven hours a bit of a push. Uh, but um, we're going to take a look at some of these measures. Uh, of necessity, I'm not going to go through the deeper, deeper um, technical content, but what I'm going to try and do is, for those of you who are not familiar with them, is to familiarise yourself with the key points about these reliefs um, to help you to understand how they might be used both in your own businesses and in your clients' businesses. Those of you here in practice, um, well, is it likely you're actually going to be actively doing R&D? I guess not, but you may well have lots of clients who can benefit from some of these reliefs. Um, those of you here representing businesses, um, hopefully there are a number of you that are going to go away with a few ideas uh, about these extra reliefs that you can be looking at. So we'll look at R&D is the big one. R&D is the most long-standing of these. R&D now, R&D relief has been around for 13 years and it's a mark of its importance in the tax system that not a single Finance Act has passed um, if I conflate the years when we've had two or three because we've had an election, not a Finance Act has passed without having some R&D in it. So it's something that government and the uh, Treasury return to regularly just to, if you like, keep it on course, do a little bit of adjustment to keep this relief on course. It's a very, very important relief. We'll also look at the new patent box. Uh, I should say patent box, because I've been told that's the right way to say it. Uh, I've never been exactly sure, and a delegate very kindly told me at the end of a lecture, patent is for shoes, patent is for patent. So uh, that's how I try and remember it without success. And um, we've got the new creative sector reliefs, which are coming on stream now. Um, a part of that's still subject to EU approval, and I think they're a bit disapproving at the moment. A little bit on capital allowances and then maybe going into one or two things that you might not have thought that was support for innovation and particularly the last one, child, su child care support. That's mainly a growth issue uh, and you may again be wondering how child care support can be a growth issue but I'll tell you that in the closing minutes uh, of my talk. I will leave uh, some time for questions at the end. It's such a big room it would be very difficult to deal with questions as we go through so if you've got questions can you hold them? Um, I know afterwards we're going on to another session uh, and I'm afraid I'm going to be out the door and in a cab because I have a, my youngest with a birthday awaiting mum coming home to make her a chocolate cake. 
so so uh, that's my plan for this evening. OK, let's dive in and start looking at some of these reliefs. One of the things I use to talk about R&D relief is an example, uh, and um, you'll forgive me if it's a bit of a broad brush example, but one of the things I say is we don't make shoes in the UK anymore. That's a subject quite dear to my heart because I'm from the part of the world where Clarks used to have a huge factory, used to employ a huge number of people, and it is now an outlet shopping centre. So we don't make shoes anymore in the UK. Well, OK, there may be a few handmade outlets, but it's to illustrate that um, certain parts of what are our historic industrial heritage have moved elsewhere in the world. And in a global economy, what nation states need to do is to find their niche. And quite a long time ago, a government of the day, and it is going back quite some time, decided that one of our niches should be innovation. We're good inventors. What government decided then was to put some tax icing around that to give it some structure and to encourage businesses to get inventing and developing. I use a client of mine as an example, and it is now a former client because uh, they've outgrown me uh, and need the services of a larger firm, um, but I'm still in touch with them. And as soon as they bring a product to market, they are already working on their next invention. It's a small, it's a very innovative company in the um, engineering field, but they know that without the next product, they'll die. So innovation for them is absolutely essential to survival. I will add that they pay very little tax indeed, and with the advent of the patent box are going to pay even less. They are very, very profitable. Let's hope they aren't held up in front of the PAC as an example of uh, the evil that is tax avoidance. Okay, R&D, the SME scheme. Now, the first thing to clear up with the SME scheme, for those of you uh, here from larger businesses, is that that's a bit of a fib from the start because the tests are different in the R&D scheme to those that we meet anywhere else. So we'll come to the exact size of SME in a minute, having given you an idea. It's a bit bigger than you think. The total deduction you can now get for qualifying expenditure on R&D is 225%. In other words, quite simply, if you spend £100, your taxable profit goes down by £225. And if that weren't enough, if that tips you into loss, then you can, as an option, surrender that loss for a payment, and as you can see from the slide, of 11%. Now, what that 11% actually gives you, combined with the form of relief, is around about £25 in cash for every £100 you spend. Every time the rate of relief changes, the rate of payable tax credit also changes to keep us just around that £25 mark. So that cash is there and available to support the company until it actually uh, gets itself into profit, until it's able to bring uh, a product to the market. This was, um, uh, I think I probably said a few minutes ago, this was introduced a long time ago, in fact, in um, 2000, the Finance Act 2000, and commenced on the 1st of April 2000. A little bit later on, we came on with the large company scheme. But it's no secret, and if you're a regular reader of the Times financial pages, which I find a bit more manageable than the FT myself, um, but you will see occasionally studies on uh, companies that undertake R&D. And repeatedly, year after year, what those studies show is that the companies that do actively get involved in R&D are among the most successful in um, their field. So it's not simply that pharmaceutical companies need to invent new drugs, but it is any company that is engaging in innovation and therefore able to take advantage of this tax relief, they tend to have um, more success. They have a higher value on the stock market if they're quoted uh, and other similar measures of success. So if your company, and if you're here from industry, isn't involved in R&D, um, and isn't involved in innovation. Now, it may be that there's a limitation. You're a service business. There's a limit to what you can do. But thinking about growth through innovation, I think R&D is one of our key, uh, our key developments. 
little bit of technical background for you, just a reminder of what you're going to get this relief on. Your qualifying spend is defined in the legislation, so you can't just simply say, I'm doing R&D. The uh, relief applies to certain types of expenditure, as you can see from the slide. Now, with larger um, businesses, there is quite a lot of debate around prototypes and actually finessing a product to bring it actually into production. And if you're here from a large business, you may well be well aware of those issues. But broadly speaking, this is a reasonable stab at R&D, given that there are some debates around the final stages as to whether that's actually R&D or uh, production costs. Um, for those of, in smaller businesses and those of you in practice, I think the most important development over the last few years is the minimum spend being abolished. It was reduced from 20,000 to 10,000 and then subsequently abolished. So this means if you are a very small company, but you are genuinely engaged in research and development, you will still be able to claim the benefit of R&D tax relief. And looking back over the five, 10, or indeed 13 years since this relief has been around, it's really come on in leaps and bounds. One of the important things for you to remember on the R&D scheme for SMEs is that this is uh, state aid. As you can see uh, from this slide uh, at the bottom, because it's state aid, that does mean there are some limitations. So it's EU badge state aid, and it does limit um, sometimes the use of the relief. Okay, the practical issues, I think, for you, if you are involved in a business undertaking R&D, is making sure that the accounting records deliver to you uh, the R&D spend in an easy, accessible way. And that might mean putting in um, a certain level of detail at the beginning so that you're able to strip out those qualifying expenditure items, just pop back to those, so you're able to strip out of your general uh, power uh, allocation, those that relate directly to the R&D activity to make the claim process much easier and much slicker. There's little point having a relief uh, if it costs too much to actually set down a claim. Um, thinking about, for you as advisors, whether internally or externally, what is an R&D project? And maybe reading a little bit, uh, both on HMRC's um, guidance and um, just using Google a little bit, because there are lots and lots of case studies around on companies that have uh, made R&D claims. And you'd really be quite surprised at how flexible and how broad the availability of R&D relief is. Recent research by the CBI, by a group for the CBI, indicates that only around 30% of SMEs who could claim R&D relief are actually claiming. So those 70% of, R and, of uh, companies are missing out entirely on this valuable tax relief. One important aspect it, it, to do with the EU rules is that there is a going concern test, and that's been modified a little bit over the last couple of years. So essentially, you're not a going concern if you are in uh, administration or liquidation, which seems self-evident. But what you need to just be aware of is it is the timing of the claim to the payable tax credit. So if you surrender your losses and seek payment, it is the timing of that in relation to the appointment of administrators. This is just a shot across the bows for those of you in practice. Sitting on files on the basis that the tax return, corporation tax return, doesn't have to go in for quite a while could be a big mistake. Because if in the interim your client is in difficulty and an administrator is appointed, that's the end of their uh, R&D ta payable tax credit claim. So just a little warning there for you. Okay, what is R&D? Well, I'm not going to go, as I said, into all the detail because we want to move on to another topic shortly. Too much of a good thing uh, can be more than enough. Um, but there's lots and lots on HMRC's website. The definition of R&D is on the screen in front of you. A project which seeks to achieve an advance in overall knowledge, not just your company's knowledge, but overall knowledge or capability in a field of science or technology through the resolution of scientific or technological uncertainty. I'm actually a director of a company that claims R&D relief, and um, our R&D relief is related to RTI because we are a very, very small tax software company, uh, and um, we use Excel. 
um, uh, which is, as some people say, a little bit Mickey Mouse. Okay, fine, but we've got customers who like it. Uh, but we had to find a way for Excel to do what RTI wanted it to do. Now, if you're starting with a base program where you're using programming languages, that's one thing. But actually persuading Excel to do certain things in, uh, is, is an immense skill. And my programmer is a very, very clever man. Uh, and he's got through all sorts of hoops with Excel and persuaded it that it can actually uh, do, RT, uh, do tagging under IXBRL. It can actually meet the company's house requirements for filing. And now it can do RTI as well. So we've claimed R&D relief for uh, the work that went on to actually establishing how to get a, uh, a tabletop product, if you like, to do some quite smart things. The questions on the screen I'm not going to go through, but they are on HMRC's guidance and they are designed to help claimants who aren't sure whether they've got a valid uh, R&D claim or not to think about the sorts of questions they might have to answer if they were dealing with the HMRC innovation team. So those hopefully you may find useful. Let's go on and round up a couple of last bits on R&D. The size criteria, as I said, are different to those that you're used to they're double so we are talking about really quite substantial companies being able to claim the very generous form of relief I will say that the uh, other or the large company scheme is a bit of a disappointment after seeing this one we'll touch on that in a moment but obviously um, that size criteria being much larger uh, is extremely helpful you're not, however, because of state aid rules, able to claim under this scheme if you have any sort of grant towards the project from anyone, from local government, from the EU, from national government, or if you carry on subcontract R&D. I might also add that there is a cap to the amount of R&D relief you can have in any year, and if you exceed that, you might also have to go into the large scheme, but it's a very large sum of money, so let's not worry about it. So less exciting, but worthy of just brief comment because it's changed this year. So we can come into the large company scheme if we've got a grant-aided uh, project or uh, maybe we're carrying on subcontract R&D, which is very common uh, that large companies uh, job out specific and very particular bits of research to small innovative businesses. So they're not carrying on the R&D for themselves, they're doing it on behalf of, for example, Shell, who do use sometimes external consultants to actually resolve a certain piece of uncertainty. 130% tax relief and no payable tax credit, distinctly underwhelming alongside its little brother. Uh, but what we have this year is the new above the line relief, which is very interesting. What the government did a couple of years ago was very smart. They went along to a chap called James Dyson and they said, you're an inventor. Come and comment on our R&D scheme. Come and tell us how it supports businesses like yours and where it actually falls down. And what Mr. Dyson said is that, generally speaking, the, uh, the decision to carry on R&D for the first time is made by the board. And the R&D tax relief is hidden in the tax comps. And that means the accountant sees it, the tax manager sees it, the auditors probably see it, HMRC sees it, but the people who make the decision, the board of directors, don't see any of that. It's not visible to them. They don't look at tax computations and they're not able to see the benefits that the company is getting. So he said, why don't you put it on the P&L account? That will shake them up. They'll be able to see it. It'll be sitting there as an income item, staring them in the face. That will help them to make that decision. And that's exactly what we've got. We've got new above the line, exactly as it sounds to a, a room full of accountants, uh, above the line tax relief, which is actually visible to the directors, so that when they are making decisions about R&D, they can immediately see that reflected in the figures they're looking at. So it's an income item. It's like having maybe some interest or something like that. Because it's above the line, this is a slightly odd bit, it's also taxable. So if you've made a profit, your above the line relief will be taxable and at a long term rate of corporation tax of 20%, which we've now got, that means 8%, 8% net of tax of your R&D spend is coming in as income to reward you, to facilitate, to support 
R&D activities. That comes in now. We've got the state aid clearance for it. So um, it applies from the 1st of April, but you won't be able to submit a claim until after Royal Assent. But I will say that would be a little bit quick off the blocks. For three years, you'll be able to choose which you prefer, old-fashioned 130 or new-fashioned 10% above the line. From April 16, it will be the only game in town. So those of you dealing with very large businesses or small businesses which take in R&D work for large businesses, um, now you can start thinking about what focus you want to go for. Okay, well, that's enough about R&D. When you've finished the invention, when you've got it a fair way along the lines, the next thing you're going to do, probably, possibly, is go and get a patent out on it. So, in trying to attract international groups, and let's make no bones about this, this, this piece of legislation is there to do what Ireland did with Google. And what Ireland did with Google is they made their tax regime so attractive that Google located themselves in Ireland. Okay? And Ireland are thrilled to bits. And the members of the PAC, who are spitting nails at the moment uh, about uh, Google and all this bad behaviour, actually, we're doing it too. They don't really seem to understand the broad sweep of how tax works on a global basis. We're doing it too because we're pinching all of the patent holders in multinationals and encouraging them to come to the UK, bring their tax sterling with them and leave the Netherlands, whose patent box regime is not as favourable as ours, and leave Belgium, whose patent box regime is not as favourable as ours. So really all the PAC are really looking at is they're looking at international tax competition through a one-way telescope. And they're looking only at the stuff we've lost and not, you know, essentially what they're saying is, well, we're really cheesed off because we won that, we lost that argument, but guess what? We're winning another game. So this is deliberate and it is designed to do what Ireland did to Google, to make companies say, gosh, that's good, let's go there. And guess what? GlaxoSmithKline are. GlaxoSmithKline are building uh, another manufacturing uh, outlet on uh, Merseyside. There will be a thousand jobs there, and that is, they have openly said, because of the patent box legislation. Okay, so again, innovation and growth. What are we? We're a nation of inventors. We're jolly good at inventing. And when we finish doing the research and development, what we've now got is a tax cheap outcome to that. When we go and we exploit the patents we've been able to get, and we make income out of selling patented items, out of very clever vacuum cleaners, and I must say the Dyson DC40 animal is probably my favorite home appliance ever. Uh, I have a blonde Labrador, a yellow Labrador, and oh my goodness, I love my Dyson. I really do. Uh, so, um, so when we're selling patented items, when we're selling the stuff we're inventing, what we're going to get is a very, very favourable tax regime. So, it has to be a, pa a patent in the UK or the EU, or it might be an exclusive license in a particular territory of a similar patent. Now, if you're going to go out and do this, you're going to have to read the backstory. There's a lot of detail in it. It was in last year's Finance Act, and really, you're going to have to start getting up to speed. Once again, there's a fair bit on HMRC's website. Once again, give it a bit of a Google and see what comes up. And like R&D, there are specialist businesses which will actually help you with your claims if you're not able uh, to do so in-house. So we're going to have a long-term tax rate of 10% on those profits, um, and that means that businesses will migrate to the UK. Now, when we're talking about a huge multinational business like GSK, it doesn't mean the whole GSK group is going to move to the UK. What it does mean is they're going to move their patent-holding companies and maybe some of the R&D that goes with it into the UK. We're not going to get Apple to relocate from where they are to over here. But what we might get is we might get some of Apple's activities put in a holding company in the UK as opposed to anywhere else in the world. 
So we're looking at creaming off that business from multinationals, not necessarily getting the entire group to come to the UK and pay tax here, but actually relocate certain things because we are the innovators. We are the ones that can drive growth through multinationals because that's what the UK does. So you can see how this fits into that psychology that is playing out on the global stage. And I think that's a really, really important point to make. Um, the accounting issues, I've put very um, politely, are the most challenging on the slide. To be completely frank, they're an absolute flaming nightmare. Uh, and since becoming chair of the tax faculty of the ICAW, I have suggested that one of our future publications for members might be a collaboration with our financial reporting colleagues in, in that faculty, a uh, joint publication on uh, the patent box, yes, the tax stuff, but much more importantly, how to set up your accounting systems so that they deliver the information you want in a, um, shall we say, a reasonably painless way. And those people that I talk to at the moment are out dealing with patent box on the ground. That's what they're talking about. They're talking about trying to get the engineering right to produce you the data so that you can measure what are called the relevant IP profits. And for those of you, I know lots of you are interested in that end of it. That is a big challenge. And now is not too early to start getting up to speed on that. Um, there is a transitional period, and patent losses are a little bit um, uh, uh, worrying. So let's, let's just go on. I've got a bit of detail here. I'm going to skim some of it because it can get too heavy. But basically, either you own the patent rights now, or um, you own an exclusive license uh, to qualifying IP rights, or you used to, you've sold it, but you've got some tertiary income coming in in relation to that patent. So you either now are a patent holder, previously were and had a patent box election in, um, and um, you're getting in a little bit of uh, tail end income. If you're a member of a group, and this is a really important one, you need to be actively managing the patent rights for the group. In groups, um, in similar to property and so on, the normal structure is to concentrate one activity in one subsid. So, um, Boots have got, I happen to know because I've lectured for them, Boots have got a property-owning subsidiary. And all of the property of the entire group lives in there and the expertise is concentrated in there and they deal with um, the uh, group's estate. Um, going over to patents now, it is normal, again because particular skills are involved, to put all of the patents in a patent holding company. Now, that patent holding company will not be the ultimate holding company of the group. It will be a subsidiary, and it will be active in this area. And that's the company we're trying to nick. We're trying to bring them in from where they are. And I've mentioned two uh, member states of the EU where they are. Um, it has historically been quite common to stick your patent holding either in the Netherlands or in Belgium. Swiss is not bad, um, but ours absolutely trumps the flipping lot of them. So um, our patent box regime is the most abusive, if you want to put it that way, because it's the one uh, that actually beats everybody else. And for that, we're going to attract those businesses to the UK. Now, if you're a, a, a holding company, you're probably not the inventor. You're probably not the company carrying on the development activity. So you have to be actively managing you're not just there as a company which simply sits as a shelf company owning all these patents. You have to be actively managing, so um, looking at uh, putting patent rights out across the world, at renewing patents and all of that sort of thing. And if you are, then you will be able to, on behalf of the group, claim patent box. I think there's too much on that slide. Um, I'm not a fan of lots on slides, but let me just highlight for you. You also need to be involved in the development of the patent. And really, either you, the company, is, or another member of the group is. A and C are the important ones. I left it all on there simply to show you that there's quite a bit more richness to this legislation than my whistle-stop tour is going to give you. But basically, either you, as a singleton company, develop this idea, or, if you're a member of a group, one of your group fellow group companies develop this idea. Then we've got some stuff around chopping and changing ownership. 
So what does mean you invented it? What does this mean? And here we are from the legislation. If it creates or significantly contributes the creation of the invention or performs a significant amount of activity for the purpose of developing it or of any item or process incorporating the invention, including ways in which the invention might be used or applied. So you either have to have invented it or a brother or sister company has to have invented it using that broad interpretation of what we mean by invented. 10% tax rate apply not to your entire profits, obviously, but to your relevant IP profits. I've referred already to the accounting challenges associated with that. There are two ways in the tax legislation of calculating it, but to attack either of them, you're going to need some good quality accounting information. Particularly the streaming method, the standard method is a sort of averaging stab and what you do is you split your turnover into IP and non-IP and you need data to do that um, and then you basically go on from there. Um, in the streaming method, what you do is take every single line in the P&L count and you allocate that on a just and reasonable basis between IP and non-IP. Now, streaming might well be something a company might choose because their costs associated with their patent items are low and their costs associated with non-IP activities are high. So you would then be looking at more profit going into the patent box. So you might elect for streaming. Streaming is mandatory for some companies, but I'm not going to go through that. That's quite a complex area. But otherwise, you use this sort of rough and ready apportionment based on the proportions of turnover. So what that says is your profitability is the same across both areas of your activities, IP and non-IP. That's really the area for you to get to grips with now because claims will be a little way off. Um, uh, now let's mention patent losses and the transition, and then we move on to something a bit more uh, relaxing. If you've got a patent box election in force, then your losses on IP activities can only be set against IP profits. Now what that means is that you're only going to get 10% relief for your losses because you're only paying 10% on your IP profits. It means that you'd need to undergo, for a company with a number of patents, some really quite intensive analysis, because generally speaking, profitability goes with maturity. So if you've got a very immature product, you're unlikely to be making money on it yet, and you might not want to claim. However, you cannot claim on a product-by-product -product basis. You can only claim on a company basis. So where a company has got various things in the mix, some really quite careful analysis will be necessary to decide whether now is the time to go for a patent box election. You can stay out and stay out and stay out and stay out until you see the profits coming and then jump in. Once you're in, you can elect to come out at any point, but as you can see from the slide, once you've done that, you have to stay out for five years. So that's quite a complex model for you to think about putting together if you're advising people. Okay. Now, all of this probably makes you think, well, small companies aren't going to do this. This is not really appropriate for small businesses. But the client I mentioned just now, who a minute they get something to the market are um, on with the next project, that is two directors and at a maximum eight staff, frequently only six. It is a small company. They do make quite a lot of money, but it is a small company. But they are at the moment setting up their accounting system to generate the information they need to downstream be able to make patent box elections. So don't dismiss it. The government is very, very keen that SMEs claim. If we say 30% of companies who can claim R&D claim it, what embarrassing percentage is it going to be in a few years' time of SMEs who could claim patent box, patent box who don't? Okay, and um, you know that could be really quite high. So think about it. Keep it at the back of your mind. I think that's really quite important. And as you can see from this slide, final comment on patent box. We've got the um, the run-in 
so that we actually get a pattern box. 10% applies to 60% of your IP profits to start with. And then, as you can see, going in. Now, what that gives you, I'm pretty sure, is 14, 13, 12, 11, 10. Yeah, you're getting 14% tax on your pattern profits now because of the combination of 20% and um, uh, the IP rate. So uh, that's going to be the run-in. Um, very, very important and my final comment is, if you haven't got a March year end, you have my deepest sympathy, because you're going to have to do all that calculation twice. So, not a pretty sight. Okay, quick mention for these two. One's in, um, and the other we're currently arguing with the rest of the EU about, if we're still speaking to them. I'm never quite sure. Um, we've got uh, the high-end television and animation scheme relief and video games. Now, the video games is the one that Europe are objecting to, but essentially, guess what? We're the best in the world at video games. What a very strange thing to be the best in the world at, but we are. Uh, we've got the most creative guys, we've got the cleverest programmers, and we are where video games get written. So um, we're going to have these extremely generous, eye-wateringly generous reliefs, millions, hundreds of millions of pounds being pumped into this sector, um, and modelled very much on film scheme relief. Now, the film scheme relief I'm referring to, for the uh, people my age in the room, is not the stuff that was licensed to muck about, but the more recent form of film relief, which is in um, the corporate sector only. So all of these can find only to limited companies. Everything I've said so far, only limited companies. Why are self-employed individuals being excluded? The answer is that there's too much opportunity for mucking about. Uh, and therefore, if somebody is innovative and wants to start a business, they need to be a limited company to take advantage of the reliefs that are there. Okay, let's just tell you a little bit more about the sort of practical impact on this. Okay, let me go back to Mission Impossible 1. Oh, gosh, that shocked you. Uh, now, why, why is the glamorous Tom Cruise scratting around in some scruffy above a tube station in London. Uh, and the answer might well be tax relief. Because what it encourages is uh, for films or chunks of films to be made in the UK, for production companies to come to the UK. Oh, would it have just been announced? Yes, it would. That the next Star Wars, isn't it? Star Wars going to be shot in the UK? There you go. That's what it's about. That is absolutely what it's about. We nick the business because we've got a more favourable tax regime. If Margaret Hodge doesn't understand the game, she wants to win all the time. You have to let somebody else win sometimes, otherwise we become a tax haven. Well, we are to the French at the moment. So. <laughs> Okay, so we've got this film tax relief, which has been good, it's been test run, it works, it's not widely abused, well, all right, not very much. Anyway, we seem to be able to shut that down. So I tell you what we do, they said. Downton went well, didn't it? Everybody loved Downton. Right then, well, we want more Downton or something like it, like Mr. Selfridge. So we're now having this very, very generous television relief to encourage not only our companies, but actually production companies all over the world to come to the UK to shoot high-end television. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about what's high-end in a minute, and animation as well, because we mustn't forget Mr. Nick Park down in Bristol, must we? And Creature Comforts and Wallace and Gromit and all that sort of thing. So high-end television animation, that's in, and we're still arguing about video games. Now, the productions must be culturally British, and I must admit myself completely stumped by the idea of a culturally British video game. Um, the only thing I can think is it might be a shoot-em-up where they're wearing British uniforms as opposed to any others, uh, but um, I'm afraid certainly flying pigs trying to hit birds or is it the other way around? I'm never sure. Um, I'm not quite sure uh, whether uh, we've got that, but we have got a lot of video games over here. Culturally British is going to be the test. Fortunately, HMRC don't have any culture people, but the Depart for, to, uh, the Department for Culture, Media and Sports have got culture people. So that's their call, I'm afraid. So that'll be quite interesting. 
So um, an additional deduction, very similar to R&D, this is the model that we use, um, an additional deduction, a very, very generous additional deduction and a payable tax credit. High-end television is described in um, the uh, finance bill. Um, not very often you see the words reality or game show in tax legislation, but there it is this year in the relevant uh, um, schedule to the finance bill. And high end is also, um, it's got to be at least 30 minutes. Uh, it can't be factual, it can't be Newsnight, it can't be Panorama, it can't be lots and lots of things, uh, but um, it's mainly drama, but it must also cost a million pounds per broadcast hour. So that's what makes it high end. Um, you will get 100% extra tax relief on your UK expenditure. If all of your expenditure is in the UK, then you will be limited to 100% of 80% of your core spend. You won't get completely double, but you will get nearly double tax relief. And if that puts you into loss, as it is pretty likely to, then you will be able to surrender those for a quite extraordinary 25% payable tax credit. OK, so you're actually going to get funding. Now, at the moment, I think it's 130 million has been put aside to actually shovel money into this scheme and is going to produce the, the, the factor on films. If I just go back for a second, the factor on films is 80 times. So for the money we've spent on it, we've generated 80 times that value of UK business which therefore will generate tax, uh, tax take, okay? But it also jobs, PAYE, VAT, and so on, okay? So that's the factor. So obviously, if we can crank this up and get that sort of return, we'll have done very, very well. I've said probably the next series of Downton Abbey, which has already been announced, and I suspect is absolutely no coincidence that this relief is there, and they were not too sure, uh, and all of a sudden, yes, they're quite sure. I don't know if Doctor Who is, A, expensive enough. Um, my daughter's been an extra on Doctor Who quite a few times, and she said some of it is a bit cardboard, really. Um, uh, but she's really enjoyed it, coming from that part of the world. They, um, they get involved. She's, she's been in several. Um, but is it expensive enough? Is it culturally British? Well, it's completely bonkers, so it must be culturally British, <laughs> must it? So... Um, so, anyhow, so there you go. There's some more sector reliefs. Now, can you start to see a picture of an economy that's been really, really struggling, but working with government, treasury, all sorts of angles? What we've got in place are a number of really, really key things that hopefully are going to start showing some traction. Okay. Now, um, oh, I've done that. I've put an extra slide in there, but let's go on. Um, I'm going to announce myself distinctly underwhelmed by this measure. Um, it was in last year's Finance Act. It allows you to get 100% capital allowances in enterprise zones. But all those, again, who are a little bit older don't get excited because uh, it's nothing like it used to be. Um, it's only for plant and machinery. It must be an enterprise zone and a designated development area. It's not enough that it's an enterprise zone. It must be new, not replacement pl plant, to support new, not replacement economic activity. So this economic activity has to be moving into this zone. It has to be expansion or a new business. It has to be new plant, okay? Are you getting the drift? We don't want to give away very much money. So that one, again, it, it's not complex, this one. It's just got so many hurdles that it looks a bit more like the Grand National than a tax measure. Uh, so um, that's that one. I thought I'd mention it because it's sort of got the innovation stroke growth theme to it, but is definitely uh, underwhelming. And then one of the budget's blockbusters. Um, and I, I don't think people are as excited about this yet as they're going to be in a year's time, um, apart from me. But I do get unreasonably excited about an awful lot of things that I probably oughtn't to if I had a proper life. Uh, so 2,000 employment allowance, absolutely fantastic. Now, I went to um, an event on the day after the budget um, hosted at uh, ICAW Morgate Place, where our chief exec, uh, Michael Itzer, was in conversation with uh, David Gork. Um, 
and it was quite nice to set up a little bit like this. He didn't have a coffee table, but, but it was sort of like Wogan, really, you know, and Michael asked the question and David Gork answered. Uh, and those of us at the back from the tax faculty who know shed loads about tax sat there holding our breath, waiting for something to go wrong, but nothing did. Um, but what the minister spoke about was very, very interesting. This sort of replaces the NIC holiday. And the NIC holiday has been an abysmal failure. Hardly any businesses have taken it up. The number, as of, and remember, it's nearly three years now. It finishes in September when it will be three years old. It's almost three years. Only 22,000 businesses have taken up the NIC holiday. That is pathetic. Why is it pathetic? Because it's too difficult. What the minister said is that government have looked at it and thought about it, and they've realised that small businesses don't do extra forms, apply online, find out about it before you start your business, fill in some more extra forms, have a different year-end process. Small businesses don't do it, even if there's money. They just don't. They wake up about a year after they should have claimed it and gone, oh, oh, what pity. So the minister said government is now well aware of that, Big round of applause for government. Excellent. Okay. And this is a massive step forward. They said, do you know what? The cheapest way? Tell you what, everybody have it. Okay. Then Margaret Hodge can say, not having Google having 2,000 quid, but the answer is they're only having one lot of 2,000 quid and Tesco's are only having one lot of 2,000 quid. Give it to everybody, then you'll make sure it gets where you want. A universal benefit. Ooh, way up. This is the other lot rowing in the other direction on the other half of government. They're going away from universal benefits. This one says, look, just everybody have it. I'll tell you what, it's cheaper. It'll get where we want it. It's the best outcome. It's not going to be very much given away to the people we don't need it anyway. So fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. 2,000 quid to spend on employers, Nick, however you like. If you are a director of a very small company and you want to put your salary up from 7696, is it this year, to 10,000 pounds, you will get employment allowance. Okay, you will get employment allowance against the first 2,000 of employer NIC, whatever. If you're Tesco's, you'll spend it in 48 seconds of the new tax year. <laughs> if you're a small business, it's going to carry you through the year. But look at it actually. Analyse this for a minute. Lots of jobs being created by small businesses, but they're part-time and they're low paid. And if you're creating part-time minimum wage jobs, you don't pay Nick. So this is even cleverer than just throwing money at small businesses. This is saying, actually, what we're going to just incentivise, just gently, is actually a little bit of higher quality employment. Maybe more hours. Maybe someone paid a little bit more than minimum wage doing a few more hours. So it's a very, very clever, so simple that it's almost genius. They're going to deliver it through RTI. Oh, gosh, I get worried people will throw buns when I say those words. Uh, but they're going to deliver it through RTI, which, of course, will be working perfectly by then. What do you mean? Of course, it is now. Um, uh, so you'll be able to take the credit through that system. And uh, another message from government to our profession, they will engage actively with um, bodies like yours, to design the delivery of it, to make it as simple and slick as possible. And that's another theme from this year's budget, is the number of times uh, that announcements have said, well, actually, yes, but what we're going to do is make sure we talk to the right people. We're going to talk to your body and other bodies, tax bodies, the ABAB team, about how we actually deliver this on the ground to make it cheap and slick, because that benefits our clients, our businesses, but it benefits government as well. Yeah, an object lesson in how not to do it has got to be high income child benefit charge. So that, I think, is an excellent development. And then finally, I've only got a couple of minutes left because I want to leave a few minutes for questions. Um, I want to go to the childcare allowance. So BPRA, I'm going to mention it's still there. It's been here for years, okay, since 2007. John Whiting's team at the OTS suggested that it was abolished because it was coming to the end of its life, and government said, no, no, I think we'll keep it for a bit longer. 
So don't miss this one. It's a bit long in the tooth, and we tend to have technical stuff falls out the back of our heads when new stuff goes in at the front. Something's got to go, and it's the oldest stuff. 100% tax relief to take on unused business premises and bring them back into use. Okay? A disused telephone exchange to be converted into a small business centre. If it's in the right area, because it has to be in a designated development area. And if you're not familiar, do again a bit of a Google and you'll find there's an assisted areas order. The last one I saw was 2007. There may have been a new one since then. But it essentially lists, lists out both um, council wards and entire local authority areas that are at designated development areas. There aren't any in Gloucestershire. Uh, but however... Okay, um, so BPRA, I'm going to slip through this. Um, it's 100% allowance on your spend. Um, if you don't want 100% because it puts you into loss, you can have 25% straight line. You have to stay in ownership for seven years, and it has to be used as business premises when you finish work. But it is an extraordinarily generous relief. Um, I've slipped on because what I want is my final screen um, on uh, technical detail and how on earth... Can childcare support be about growth through innovation? Well, it's about growth. It might not be very innovative. I think this is a very, very clever idea. This was another budget blockbuster, except it was announced on the day before budget. And let me just say, how clever was that? You know that budget day is a good day to bury bad news because we read that once and somebody got disciplined for it, didn't they? For, and Barclays had a go this year, releasing information about bonuses on budget day. Well, it works in reverse as well. If you want something to grab the guy, limelight, if you're government and you're about to uh, announce something dead exciting, then you wouldn't do it on budget day because it will get overtaken by how much they put on fags and when's petrol going up. So they announced it the day before. Very clever. It had a day in the limelight all to itself. This is a really, really clever move. Why? Why is it so clever? Well, let's get some facts. We've got the most expensive childcare in Europe by quite a long way. Okay? Now, dredge up your economics. So let me ask you, if we've got the most expensive childcare in Europe, why have we also got the biggest shortage of supply given that economics says if there's a very high price, new entrants will come in and that will bring the price down. Well, something's not working in the economics of that model. Childcare provision, the normal supply and demand, isn't working. And the answer is because we've got a shortage because parents cannot afford to pay the price. So if new entrants come in, they'll come in initially at the price, that's what um, economics says, and then the more you flood the market with provision, the more the price has to come down. Parents can't afford to pay. So if providers come to the market, parents can't afford to pay. So what are we going to do? We're going to give them 20% towards their childcare costs. That should be enough of a spin to the economic wheel to actually then get new entrants coming in because parents will be afford to pay, um, and then we'll get new entrants coming in, then the price will probably come down a little bit. Can you also see how, outside of this, this idea about letting people care for more kids at once actually also stimulates provision? So what we're doing is we're playing around with the economics, and it's, not, it, it's, it's really demand-side reform, not supply-side reform. But by sorting the demand side, we'll get the supply side to work. And hey, there'll be loads of childcare and the price will come down. So it's a very, very, very clever move. So it's going to be paid for by abolishing the childcare vouchers, which I would think for most employers is probably a relief, to be honest. Um, you will, if both parents are working, you'll be able to have a special childcare savings account. Every £80 you put in, government will put 20 quid in to match it. And you'll be able to save up to £6,000 per child per year. That money can only be used to pay for approved childcare in nurseries with childminders or with nannies if they're Ofsted approved or equivalent for other parts of the UK. Um, but this is, again, a growth thing because there are going to be a lot more nursery providers as a result. Over the next couple of years, we should see that also starting uh, to move forward.
So those are all the things that are around at the moment that I thought had anything to do with innovation, with growth. And I think you'll agree, um, although I'm making an apolitical point, the government has worked quite hard to put things into place. What we have to do now is go out and use them. Any questions? So there's a mic coming so that everyone can hear. Thanks. If we identify a client that could qualify for R&D um, and you've missed it, can you go back into previous years and make a claim? You'll be able to go back as long as the CT is open. Um, you won't be able to use error or mistake relief, so you're essentially looking at um, the op open years. So if you filed a CT return, you've got until two years after the end of the AP, so you're only going to be able to go back a little way. Gentleman over there. Uh, that was very good. Um, one thing I was going to say is the creative sector relief, about the film tax relief, I think um, it's worth pointing out about the EIS, where you get 30%. Yep. Um, that is one of the most fantastic things, which isn't actually, as long as you're a taxpayer, you get yep. that back. Yep. And that's not really been publicised too much. And no, you're You don't right. normally get 30% anywhere. So. Yeah. Yeah. Worth, worth stressing that point. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yes, EIS, um, using EIS as an investor uh, in a company that's actually going to go into these sectors, um, yeah, it's got, it's got gold plating on it, definitely, absolutely. Going on to the childcare vouchers, mm -hmm. will, it, will the same rules and regs apply, for example, term after the fifth birthday, then the funding would stop? Um, my understanding is that it's going to go up, I think it's going to go up to about eight. Um, I think because it's going to be, I'm, not, I'm, I'm saying eight, and that's, that sort of rings a bell, but I, it's, it's obviously going to look at out-of-school provision as well. Um, and certainly, I've got childminder clients who are thinking, ooh, excellent, this is going to be really good. Um, how can I take on more children? I've actually got one childminder lady, her husband is now training. He's been made redundant, um, he's worked in engineering, loves kids, and he's now training to get a qualification so that she can expand um, because they'll both be working from home. So it's quite interesting dynamic going on. But yeah, I don't think, uh, it's, not the, it's not the vouchers for nursery, it's more the employer vouchers. Um, the, I will add, the income limit, I might have put it on my slide, but the income limit is 150000 so um, it shouldn't really cause too many people problems on that front. Yes, yeah, sorry, again on the childcare. Yeah. You did say that um, they could um, have 5000 saved in an account. Yeah. Would that account be a bank account, a childcare provider, as in Acor, Eden Red or whatever? Um, what I understand is that this is going to be, I imagine it like something called a childcare ISA. Now, that's, that's wrong. It's, that isn't what it is. But a special account that is used to pay for childcare only, but is not attached to a particular provider, because otherwise it wouldn't work. Um, now, we're, we're going to 15 for this to come in, and I'll give everyone in the room an opportunity for a quick think about whether they think that might be autumn or perhaps before the general election that would be the one uh, um, but obviously we've got about a year to thrash out the details and certainly you know I'm sharpening my elbows to get in there and find out what they're thinking of doing again for me slick delivery both for the consumer end of it and for HMRC's end of it but yeah my understanding would be a bank account you'll put the money in um, the holder of the bank account will claim ingoing tax relief for you and then you'll be able to use it to pay for childcare. Appreciation to Rebecca for what's been a very full. Cool.